Our guest today is Stephen Balaban. Stephen is co-founder and CEO of Lambda Labs, which provides deep learning workstations, servers, and GPU cloud services. That is, the kinds of compute clusters that enable training the large neural net models that are yielding today's most capable AI systems. This might sound like a pretty natural thing to embark on today when everyone talks about artificial intelligence, at least if you think it's possible to compete with the big three cloud providers. But Stephen actually had the foresight to start Lambda in 2012, when deep learning had just started to give its very first signs of life. Lambda's customers include Apple, Meta, Microsoft, John Carmack's Keen AI, and many more. In fact, we've been Lambda customers both at Berkeley and at Covariant. Stephen, so great to have you here with us today. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks for having me. Now, Stephen, before diving into today's conversation, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and data set versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all, of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of Weights and Biases. Stephen, um, let's dive in here. You are the founder and CEO of Lambda Labs. What does Lambda do? We are an AI infrastructure provider. We provide the world's least expensive GPU cloud service with H100s for $1.89 an hour, which is an unbelievable price. And we also provide on-prem AI infrastructure, so workstation servers and on-prem clusters and we're really basically a company that's built around building for people who are training and inferencing neural networks. Now, those that kind of compute is a very hot topic right now. I mean, recently, um, I saw in the press, somebody asked Sam Altman, you know, what, what's happening at OpenAI? What are the bottlenecks? And OpenAI, having recently gotten $10 billion in funding, says their bottleneck is GPUs. Um, there's many headlines saying there's GPU shortages everywhere. How, how does that play into what you're doing? How do you even get hold of the GPUs that you want to put in your cloud? We have really tight relationships in our supply chain with all the, all the different pro providers of servers, PDUs, but, you know, you know, of course, most importantly, NVIDIA, who has such a phenomenal GPU product in the market that everybody demands and is using. And... I think that what you're seeing in the market today is sort of because chat GPT has been the fastest growing consumer product in the history of capitalism, and we're all starting to use it every day in lieu of other, 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 you know, whether it's instead of doing a Google search, you might ask chat GPT, um, you know, and, and, you know, working with chat GPT, almost like a colleague. I think that the historical sort of analogy here is a little bit of like the the rollout of broadband internet across the United States, the rollout of cell tower infrastructure across the United States, where there's a sort of this new thing, there's almost nearly unlimited demand on one end of it. And there's there's a lot of companies that are gonna need to be involved as part of an ecosystem to deploy AI infrastructure to the world. Like I think that there's probably between you know, the world needs about 10 to 100 times more GPUs than it has today. 10 to 100 times more. That, that's, that's amazing. And, and not only that, I think it'd be great if they were a, a little cheaper because I think the, the high demand and the shortage 
also is really driving up the prices, um, it seems. Yeah. So what, what we kind of look at this, there's, there's, there's almost like there's, there's always two ways to sort of, um, reach a uh, market clearing equilibrium, right? You know, the, the, to reach, to reach an equilibrium, you can either, you know, raise price or you can dramatically increase supply. And I think that where it's sort of in the same way that, um, if you are a oil refiner and the market demands Pennsylvania sweet crude or whatever it is, you, you don't really get a sort of raise prices. You know, all, all you can do is sort of like increase your supply. And we're, we're kind of seeing the same thing, which is like, we have a strategy actually where we're trying to be, you know, where we, we actually are the like sort of industry price setter. Like we have, we have gone down to as low as it is physically possible to run and deploy these GPs at scale. And so basically we're, we're kind of trying to solve it from the other perspective, which is just to dramatically increase the supply of GPs in the world by buying more, deploying more into data centers, and then just having a flat low price across. Now that's a really good point, right? If, if you just sell the GPUs, they might go underutilized because somebody uses it, doesn't use it, but you're racking them up in the Lambda cloud. So no GPU has to ever go unused. As long as there's demand from somebody somewhere, you, you can serve up uh, GPUs to them. Well, the, that's, that's definitely right. I, I think the, the, the way that we, we look at it is if, if you deploy GPUs and they sort of like sit like they, they lie there for 50% of the time, then you kind of need to increase prices by a factor of two, right? That you, you know, right. Let's say if you sell something for, if you sell something for a dollar and 10 cents an hour for a 100s, for example, if these were, if they were only sitting at 50% utilization, we would have to charge probably $2 and 20 cents. Whereas if, if they're at hundred percent utilization, then you can bring the price down to sort of just what, you know, kind of, uh, just a little bit above what what it costs to uh, to run and buy and, and 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 depreciate those those GPUs, and so we 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 definitely look at it from the perspective of bring prices as all the way down, such that you're you're sitting at a very very high level of utilization, because that's actually what gives the lowest price across the board to everybody. And I just want to confirm from my own research yesterday that indeed there are these pricing comparisons, and Lambda comes in at the lowest price for, for the same product. So it's, a, it's a apples to apples comparison. Yeah. You come in at the lowest price, which is phenomenal. You gotta wonder, how are you able to do that? Because um, you're offering the same GPU, but somehow you manage to run your operation in a way that you can offer it at a lower price. How do you do it? Yeah, so there's definitely that aspect, as I just mentioned, of like, utilization so like by bringing the price down and making so that we're 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 always at sort of like a very very high level of utilization you just can you you do a you do a really great job of sort of like reducing your costs and thus can offer it at a lower price um with what a lot of the other bigger clouds do is will sort of over provision so that they have sort of spike capacity and then what what ends up happening is you sort of have this what what we call a spike tax, where you know, in order to support somebody spiking up and down, you end up sort of, of course, having to have that much capacity at any given time. If it, if it lays fallow at all, that that's waste in the system that causes an increase in price. And so um, that's one aspect of it. Two is we're just super hyper focused on delivering the best price performance, like delivering the most deep learning flops per dollar, right? I mean, everything down to the rack layout, to the to the systems that we're putting in are all just focused on deep learning training and inference. And thankfully, actually, what's quite interesting is those things are converging, right? Historically, you might have used, for example, A100s or V100s for training and then T4s for inference. But now we're seeing with the large language models that, you know, people are doing big InfiniBand networked A100 and H100 clusters for training LLMs and 
also for inferencing them. And that's kind of an interesting aspect of the market is that the AI, I think infrastructure markets converging down to more of a unified AI infrastructure, you know, compute substrate. And so, so it's like focused down to you know every aspect of the business. How do we get the most deep learning flops to the user per dollar? Um, I, that, that also co- goes to like our pricing and like our overhead, right? So for example, our sales process, um, we have published prices on the website for our cloud service that are not negotiable. And in fact, you will get the same exact price as our hyperscaler customers. So we have hyperscalers that come to us and our, and our customers of our GPU compute and you will get the same price if you are a small startup company only getting a few GPUs as a massive hyperscale or getting tens of thousands of GPUs from us. And, uh, you know, because we remove the negotiation aspect, we actually have like lower overhead, higher, you know, deal close rate, et cetera. And so, for example, you just can't, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be fairly certain at $1.89 an hour for an H100 that you have the lowest price in the world and that, you know, a big, big, massive megacorp is paying the same price as you. That's amazing. Now, as an engineer, I'm curious when you think about, you highlighted, you know, high utilization, high efficiency in setting things up, high efficiency in the sales process to not even really have a sales process to just be super transparent and people know they get the lowest prices and the same prices. But if I look from the pure engineering point of view, kind of what's running um, from a hardware point of view, there is the cost of the GPUs, there is the cost of the servers in which the GPUs are set up, and there is the cost of the, um, I guess, the storage that might back this, and then there is the cost of energy. And when you look at these, is there is there one that clearly dominates, or is this a pretty balanced cost across all of these at this point? The biggest cost is, is definitely, I mean, anyone can do the back of the envelope math on it. And the, you know, the biggest cost of this stuff is the depreciation of the actual hardware, meaning the, mm-hmm. the, the, the servers, the GPU servers that are, that are in the data center. That's, that's the biggest cost. Power is a big, big, important cost as well, of course. Um, but I would say the biggest is definitely that what's called the depreciation expense. It's really amazing here about to offer this, um, in some sense you, you hit this mark. But that, that's where you are today, of course, which is amazing. But I got to wonder, when you started Lambda, right, and you start providing these cloud services, there's the big three, like Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, AWS, Google Cloud, those three. It, it just seems from, a, from, from as an outsider that they got to have cornered the market. They got to have figured this out. It's got to be so hard to compete with them, but somehow you decided that actually there is opportunity to do better, to offer things at lower cost. How how did you kind of make that call that that should be possible? I think when you read any of like the the stories of of the founding of any of the great companies in the United States or the world, there's always that sort of aspect of the the that the people who are the big incumbent players are just people too and certainly they're smart people they're they're well capitalized companies but if you if you're at all a student of history in in any of the industries any of the industries that have cropped up in the United States, whether it's big box retail and the story of Walmart and the story of, um, you know, if you read Sam Walton's Made in America, it's a really great book about the the founding history of Walmart. Or if you read about the founding of Standard Oil or the founding of Ford Motor Company, there's always this sort of aspect of there are big companies and big players, but they're just people too, and you can compete with them. And that's, that's like the way capitalism works. And um, I think there's, there's this, not to like start quoting Steve Jobs, but I'll do it, which is, you, you know, Steve Jobs said something to the effect of, you know, you, you get to the point, you look around and 
all the things that are built in the world, whether it's the screen that I'm looking at right now, the camera I'm looking into, the chips in the camera, the the ASM, uh, ASML photolithography machine that it's running, the pipes that are connecting all that, a, 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 everything is built by a person. And when you realize that they're just people and you can build something in the world too, that, 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 that you can make something in the world yourself, it's a pretty, I think, empowering perspective to have. So I just, I, I just think it, it's always possible to build something better or great, even if there are big incumbents that look very challenging to go up against. And it's very inspiring, Stephen. Um, is there, was there any discussion when you started the company about, you know, with the, with the founding team, you know, what you would embark on? Was it from the very beginning clear deep learning? Was, was it clear to you deep learning is going to take off dramatically? And if we focus on that specifically, we can do something really amazing? Anyone who's like really into deep learning can t tell you sort of like the the series of things that that happened to them that that got them it converted them into true believers, right? Um, for me, it was I, I, I think I, you know I read originally the the Andrew in Google cat face paper where they trained sort of a uh, on a bunch of YouTube data and, and and they were able to examine the neurons and they saw a cat face inside of that and I was like wow that's that's cool. And it actually performed uh, well on some image recognition tasks. And then in 2012, when the AlexNet paper came out, you know, out of Jeff Hinton's lab with, you know, Alex Kershevsky and Ilya Seltzberg, I hope I'm pronouncing their last names correctly. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but when that paper came out, and I think they had trained it under their desk with two GPUs. And it just completely blew away ImageNet. Like if you were, if you were in the field, right? But at the time, and it just completely blew away. You know, ImageNet was this impossible mountain to climb. It seemed like, wow, we've made a really big dent in climbing that mountain. And when I saw that and I saw some of the um, weights and the representations that were being learned, right, it, it, it's sort of like it really clicked for me. And I, I really dove in. Um, I, I'm sure you you probably remember the like, the Theano deep learning tutorials that were run by University of Montreal, right? Um, and they had these like stacked denoising autoencoder tutorials. And again, you could sort of look at the weights that you were training and just sort of look at whether it's an MNIST thing and you'd see strokes at the lower levels and it, it would get higher and higher up the network and it would have, you know, the 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 the, the weights or learning representations of numbers that were combining these different stroke things. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, this is so clearly the future of computing. Um, I, I, I really, to me, it was just like a, a no brainer. And then I think the, the, the next thing that really got me inspired um, was, was Alex Graves, 2013 RNN handwriting generation paper. Um, and I remember seeing the sort of handwriting generation that, that was, that was being done with RNNs recurrent neural networks at the time. And I just thought, wow, you know, um, that's, that's so cool. And then, so like, that's really what got me to become sort of this deep learning convert. It was that I was in a field, which was face recognition at the time, all the methods were like local binary patterns and, um, uh, you know, um, PCA and Fisher faces. Right. And do when deep learning came in, it was like a, a bull, it was like a freight train just completely you know that that meme of the freight train like hitting the bus and the bus just goes that that's like now the bus was like sort of tr traditional computer vision pattern recognition and this was like deep learning and i really saw that sort of like coming for for everything else um at that time and so it, it was just like a good good timing for um um you know for 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 for, for if, if you will a founding moment at the company um you know, for us to be founded when all that stuff is happening. Um, the the founding story of Lamb is like a little more complicated in terms of like, it wasn't like, oh, we had this founding team. We had tons of funding from the beginning. We started off actually as a face recognition API, right? 
and there wasn't there wasn't a team. It was just me, <laughs> and uh, for a number of years until my my brother uh, joined in 2014, um, and so so it, it, there wasn't this sort of like this painting this grand vision of we're going to be the deep learning infrastructure provider to the team. It was it was really more of a um, an incremental thing of we're very into deep learning. We are building these things for ourselves. And then of course, getting really good at building the infrastructure ourselves. And then eventually sometime around 2016, 2017, uh, enough people had been converted such that it could support a picks and shovels business where you're providing infrastructure to other companies instead of doing the actual vertical work yourself. Just recently, you had another big funding round. Um, what are your plans with it? The big plans are to continue to rapidly grow our, our cloud. I mean, our cloud is growing at such a pace right now. I mean, we we have we have sixty x in the last twelve months. I, I'm not going to talk about any particular numbers, but it's a very, very it, it, it's now a very big business, and we are just full speed ahead deploying as many H100s with. 3,200 GBPS and Finiband into data centers across the United States and giving those to people for the literally the cheapest price in the entire world. And that's like, that's all we do. That's what we do. With, you know, that's, that's all we're doing with it is continue, you know, what, what should be really clear from that though, is that that amount of money is like not the kind of money that you need for, um, doing the CapEx for building these, you know, deploying tens of thousands of GPUs. And, um, you know, we, we are able to do that using other sort of financing methods. And like, we have sort of outside, outside sources that are not our announced equity raises that are allowing us to do these large deployments. Yeah. But it's not too hard to, uh, to, to use GPUs and <laughs> especially set up nicely in the cloud as collateral to uh, <laughs> to get to get yeah, money from people. Exactly right. You know, there's there's a physical asset there that is certainly collateral in in that end. Um, but but the you know in terms of what's next, it's just like continuing to be the source of the cheapest deep learning training and inference compute in the world at bigger and bigger and bigger scales. And our goal is to be the number one deep learning cloud in the world and the number one GPU cloud in the world by any metric of that, you know, whether it's the lowest price, the number of GPUs, the speed of the interconnect, the um, time to launch from the moment that you want a uh, GPU and also importantly, just like the sales process, right? Because I'm sure you, you've been involved in these negotiations. Every single startup company that's listening to this right now is involved in AWS negotiation where, or 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 cloud negotiations where they have haggling on price and they have to talk to business development people and they have to get quota. And you know we cut that all out. You have a decision. How many GPs do you want? Because your price is the lowest price in the world, and it's the price that our hyperscaler customers pay, and it's the price that your startup's going to pay. Now, one thing that's been very interesting in the market, and that is also the case for Lambda, I, I, I've, I've seen, is that um, these days, some people will also, or companies really, will want to reserve capacity in the cloud, right? And... Um, I'm curious, when did you see that start happening and how important is that becoming for companies to have these reserved capacities in the cloud? That's kind of always been a part of the story of cloud services is, you know, reserved instances where you're paying a much lower price for a contractual commitment. And I would say that's always been a part of the story for any company that's using cloud services in, and, and the same is true for those who are using it for training and running neural networks. So that's been, that's been going along for a while. I, I'd say though that it's become more and more important to actually 
have put that order in and and gotten the allocation um you know that that's that's the more important thing now is like are you even able to get access to it because um you know it, it it takes some time i mean you know there's there's definitely an aspect of lead time um between the moment you sign a contract and the moment that you're going to get actual access to gpus yeah because that's the story i'm hearing more and more is that it's not just about putting money in to get cloud access to gpus it could be that there's they've all been reserved already by by others and making it very hard to even find the gpus now obviously you're growing your cloud very fast and and catering to you know people who still are looking but it seems one of the big challenges today yeah it, look it, it's a big challenge but like that's literally our entire our entire business is just continuing to deploy thousands upon thousands and thousands of gpus every single month to meet the demand of customers like that and so like you know we're, that's that's what we're in the business of doing and we're 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 really world class at it and so like it's sort of one of these things where it's a challenge it it just it, it does take some time after you've signed a contract with us but more and more more and more gpus are coming online every single day and i think that while there's like extreme tightness right now you know we're we're going to start seeing that um loosening up in the future uh i i i think it may look having been in the industry of of actually providing infrastructure for now half a decade it, it I'll, I'll say it's felt like there's been a gp shortage for the last five years right so it's almost like uh <laughs> right because you know initially it was crypto and then it was right all these all these other things it's like you know crypto and then the 2020 there was the supply chain crisis and uh, right. So it's like, I feel like there's been a GP charge for five years. And so the point is that like, well, we keep deploying more and it, it, it all works out. And I, I think the way that I, if, if there's one thing I'd say to startup founders and, and companies is like, Hey, look, the way that it works is the sooner you commit, the sooner you get your GPUs, <laughs> that's it. Right. It's, it's just like a FIFO queue of like, this is, you know, uh, this is the stuff that was the stuff that's going online today were were contracts uh, signed months ago. Then that's just kind of how it goes. Now, you've alluded to large language models as a very big trend, of course, requiring a lot of compute, both for training and inference. Are there other types of training that you see happen that is emerging as pretty heavy workloads on, on the Lambda cluster? Yeah, the, the, w w so obviously LLMs. Obviously, you know, diffusion networks uh, uh, type of sort of image generation type of stuff, as well as the, um, you know, I guess you get out, I'm going to use the term Gen AI, but really what we just call that was generative networks, right? You know, any type of generative network, whether it's generating audio, generating images, generating video, those are the heavy workloads we see on the generative side. And then on the LM side, which I mean, the promising and crazy thing about the LLM stuff is that when it gets three to 10 times better, you know, it, it's, it's such a general solution to a lot of problems and it's pretty amazing. It's basically, you know, LLMs as software is something that could be thought of. And I, I, I think that basically the next maybe 10, 15 years of the economy is going to be LLMs as software. Yeah, they can, they can do a lot of amazing things. Uh, it's definitely surprised me how capable they've become so so quickly. One of the things that's seen a big push in the AI community is to see if open source models can be built that can possibly match the performance of some of the closed models that are built at, uh, ironically, OpenAI um, and, and Google and so forth. And um, Lambda announced a, a big push in that direction too. Can you say a bit more about that? We really want to see a lot more innovation in the sort of open open source model side of uh, uh, of the world. I think that absolutely hats off to Facebook for for doing the whole llama thing. I think that that's like step one. Now. Of course, what we want to see is not just 
open code for training and open models, but commercially restricted. We want to see full commercially usable model weights out in the world because again, everything that we do is like sort of related to reducing waste so that we can provide a lower cost for our customers, right? What is more wasteful than retraining a model to a good solid checkpoint over and over again? And how many companies are just retraining to to that? And how many megawatts of power, how many billions of dollars of CapEx are being wasted when you could just start with a pre-trained model and that's like we, we want to get the world to there because the, the 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 less waste there is, the lower our prices can be, and the more amazing stuff the world's going to have. And so we are, you know, offering to uh, uh, the 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 community is sort of a chance to say, hey, let's train an open model that is commercially usable, and we have some infrastructure that we've we've cordoned off for use by a, a team that's willing to sort of do that. And so we're we're working on selecting a team. We've been interviewing and talking with a few of these, um, a few groups who are interested in training an open LLM that's commercially usable. And uh, you, you know, I think you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that um, shortly. I'm really excited to see what's gonna happen there. Um, and is it still the case? Because in the original announcement, it was also possible to apply. You could propose yeah. open source projects that could then be uh, done on Lambda Cloud. And we're still interviewing and, and selecting teams. And so uh, maybe what I can do is I can, you know, you can put a, a link in the description or otherwise. Absolutely. Um, uh, you can... Uh, you can link to that application for if, if you're if you're running a company or have a group of people that have experience training in LLM and you you'd like GPU resources you know H one hundreds with InfiniBand to train that well then uh, please do apply there and uh, we'd love to sort of talk with your team. Talk about building software, um, Lambda itself, while hyper focused on setting up the cloud has also released some Chain AI demos uh, somewhat recently. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I think what the other thing in terms of you asked earlier about the question of like us supporting open models. So in addition to that sort of application process for getting access to some compute, you know, we, we've also been big supporters of Luther AI and actually worked with some of the core people there too help establish them as a actual nonprofit entity that can accept donations. And so, um, you know, we've been working really closely with a lot of people in the, mm. if you will, open open model space. And so we, we were really big proponents of that. Just again, just from an engineer's perspective, waste is bad, waste is evil. And let's like, you know, get the world to the point where we can start from a, a really great foundation point, right? That's what I'd say. It's called a foundation model. It's something we are supposed to start with. You're not supposed to pour, you know, everyone, not everyone's supposed to have to, you know, start and build with a, their own foundation themselves. Um, going on to the sort of uh, generative AI demo product that we recently launched. So, you know, we, we, we've got a team that we've got an internal machine learning team that creates whether it's fine-tuned stable, uh, fi fine-tuned uh, diffusion networks or whatever, you know, just fun fun projects. So we did some things like text to Pokemon. I don't know if you saw that uh, a while mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so we, we we made that a text to Pokemon network where you can type in, you know, Martini Mon, and it will make a you know a Pokemon in the shape of a Martini glass. And um, we also did a text to Naruto model where. It would turn any 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 you know you could just type in some text and it would generate a cool animated anime uh, Naruto style version of it. Um, and our team was sort of like building these things, and we wanted a place for them to host that and make it really easy to you know show that to the world. And so again, just sort of with the ethos of building for yourself and building for ourselves. We just sort of built this way to, you know, easily take a repository that has a Gradio file in it and 
upload it and have it run inside of inside of Lambda Cloud. And so you can go on to lambdalabs.com and check out under our Gen AI demos. There's like a bunch of public demos. Um, the person who manages like the largest stable diffusion uh, web UI ported theirs over to our cloud. And and again, it's just the cheapest cheapest way to run this stuff in the world. It's 60 cents an hour for an A10 from Lambda. I mean, it's just so inexpensive and you can generate a bunch of images. I actually used it to generate a few control net images, which I don't know if you've played around much with control net, but wonderful stuff. Uh, and, and, and you can do that where you can spin it up, do it for half an hour, spin it down. It's 30 cents of compute. This brings up an, another, uh, question for me. You mentioned the different types of GPUs, right? H100, A100, A10, um, I think it's one of the things that traditional cloud providers were really good at, have been good at, still probably good at, is that state-of-the-art compute today becomes non-state-of-the-art compute a year or two later, but they still find use cases and a market for this not latest, greatest compute still creating a lot of value. Um, and you're alluding to something here, similar here. Um, but I do wonder to what extent you expect that to be true um, in in the AI slash deep learning space that the GPUs from today will still be helpful five years from now. I, I mean, I, I think that's that's true. When you know, th there's definitely a time frame on it, right? Like when I first started, I I I built a rig and it had some like I think GTX 580s in it. Right. I want to say that had like either two or four gigabytes of VRAM in it. And so like that's not really usable for building and running a modern, like even you know, a modern LLM or or anything like that. But there's definitely an aspect of over time it becomes less useful. But there are still use cases for all of the previous generations. And um whether it's whether it's running a smaller version, right? You know, for example, you know, a llama seven billion parameter model doesn't need doesn't need eighty gigabytes, for example, right? It could it could get away with a little bit less, and so I think that that's kind of how the the world will continue to be. It's sort of like there's the new generation, the biggest, baddest, most powerful models are running on the latest, and then sort of either previous generation or sort of new reformulations where there's um, whether it's a model distillation or quantization or sort of paring down right of a state-of-the-art model as well as the older models will run on the previous generations of cards and and again the more the more a company can focus on maximally maximally utilizing its capital expenditures the, the lower the prices can be. And and then that's where we're super, super focused on that. And um, uh, I told, I couldn't agree with you more that like, you know, let's, let's make it so that people can continue to use these cards 10 years down the road. That'd be nice. Now, GPUs originally actually were developed for us graphics cards, right? Graphics processing unit. It still says graphics. If I mean, <laughs> nobody has. Graphic, yeah. need, it's a graphics processing unit. Um, I guess with the image generative models, it's maybe kind of still <laughs> graphics. But for the language models, not much graphics happening there. Um, these GPUs were developed for gaming. Yes. Repurposed as is initially for deep learning. And then, of course, NVIDIA made them even better for, for deep learning, but continues to call them GPUs. Um, but I have a sense that we're about to come full circle because just about a year ago, you wrote a blog post stating that deep learning is the future of gaming. Um, so that seems full circle for me that these GPUs will be used for, for gaming and, and hence graphics again. Can you say a bit more, why is deep learning the future of gaming and how? The sort of demo if you will, that I originally saw that made it super clear was uh, 2015, 2016. Again, it was an Alex Gray's demo of uh, uh, sort of, it was training it, uh, this sort of, uh, it, it, it was looking at some sort of racing game and and he was able to sort of 
um, generate hallucinations, uh, almost like in a dream, you know, it was able to sort of like generate a, a couple of the next frames of it. And, you know, as input into this, 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 this model that was trained on game data, um, it of course had a part of that vector was like the controller, right? And, 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 and he was able to even do something where they started in, in the generation state and then actually plugged a real controller into this um, model. And, and you were able to, in a, you know, kind of control the dreamlike hallucination of that neural network. And I remember seeing that in 2015, 2016. And again, I, I can send this to you after and you can put a link somewhere. It's an amazing demo. And at that point, I was like, okay, wow. This is how all of these games are going to be generated, you know, in the future is that it's going to be somehow, um, you know, generated by a neural network, plugged in real controls from a human. And so that was like the, the first seed that I ever got of like, this is how it's going to revolutionize gaming. All right. And so that's a fully end to end neural rendered video game. Right. Um, the, the other demo that I actually only saw very recently, it was the inspiration that sort of uh, to, 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 to write that blog post was. This sort of Dungeons and Dragons demo where somebody was wearing a VR headset, they walked in and um, it, you know, it used sort of a neural network to do speech to text, text into an LLM brain of an NPC. NPC has some sort of context about what's in its inventory, what its role is in this Dungeons and Dragons sort of, uh, you know, fantasy, high fantasy world. And then, you know, they went up to the bartender and said, hey, how are you doing? You know. Um, and then, and then the LLM responds and then they do a text to speech neural network generating it, the, 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 the response and, and they're able to interact with the, the vendor. They did another sort of, um, they were able to say, well, you know, how, what, what, where's a good place to go hunting, you know, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, I really think that that's that that's what I mean by the future of gaming. It's almost like a new medium. It's not quite video games. It's more sort of somewhere in the like this realm of like hallucinated dream of like you're gonna be. I, I think that you're gonna be able to go and say, "Hey, uh, I want to you know interact in this like high fantasy world, or maybe make it a cyberpunk world, or I want to do an underwater sort of um, uh, an underwater um, sort of." thousand leagues or under the sea type of uh, uh science fiction early science fiction thing and then it's going to generate a three-dimensional world with very intelligent llm powered npcs um i think that that's possible today with basically a million dollar supercomputer to run that for one person um but i think that in the next 10 years that's going to get crunched down and be able to run on a single gpu and that's that's what i mean by it's the future of gaming is that it's going to enable a bunch of new, you know, new gaming interactions where it's instead of it being sort of um, in 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 Skyrim or in Oblivion, it's like, you know, halt, you've broken the law, you know, go to jail or you know, uh, you know, pay your fine. You'll you'll actually be able to interact and talk with this guard and 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 it, it, it'll it'll make it so it's instead of chick pick A B or C, it'll be say anything you want. Which it's going to really open up a lot of gameplay mechanics. Got it. So it's it's really expanding the the gaming possibilities, not just replacing current way of designing with just a neural net doing the same thing more easily. It's a whole new realm of of gaming that opens up. Yeah, I think it's a whole new media. Real, it's a whole new form of media that opens up. To be honest, and it's somewhere in between games, it's somewhere in between movies, it's somewhere in between sort of um, a hallucination or something. But it's uh, it, it, it it's gonna be that that's gonna be like the farther future. In the short term, it'll be like, all right, you know, our next Bethesda title is gonna get LLMs that are gonna be running locally that are gonna be generating some of the NPC dialogue. You know, it's gonna get some sort of neural render graphics that is, um, you know, a live real time neural render graphics, and then eventually it sort of will evolve, I believe, into this sort of new medium of um, generated sort of storytelling uh you know uh, uh, uh neural network mediated storytelling very, very cool um steven obviously you're very busy <laughs> racking up as many gpus as possible yes. making them accessible to as many people as possible at, at the lowest possible price 
Um, that that's obviously a very busy activity. But do you ever have time to just relax? And what do you do? You know, I I do I do I mean I have, um, I have kids, and so that that that's that takes up some some of my time uh, in terms of like fun activities I like to do with the kids and it, it, stuff like gardening. So we have um, we we have a garden, and and I it, it's fun to um, you know plant plant corn and beets in a row, um, and take care of them. I, I also am, a, I'm also a big gamer too. And so I, I'm, uh, I'm, a uh, I play, I play, you know, I get, get, get a place in Minecraft and, uh, Valorant or Diablo two type of stuff. So do you play those with your kids? I, uh, not so much Diablo two uh, with the kids, but uh, maybe maybe more on the uh, Minecraft side. My son really loves playing Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seems like a great one because I mean it. It's it's a very lots of opportunity for creativity um, in that game. Yeah, and and well, that's that's another great example that I don't know if you recently saw somebody tied up. GPT four with Minecraft and, and it was able to sort of um, get its way to finding diamonds and mining diamonds, um, which was kind of cool to see all through a language model powering sort of its strategy and planning. And that that's quite interesting as well, just in terms of seeing how the LMs are starting to be able to um, you know be repurposed for things that I maybe work more traditionally pure you know sort of reinforcement learning type of stuff um and it is quite interesting so well steven um i really enjoyed this conversation thanks so much for making the time yeah no peter thank you so much for having me on and and i really enjoyed the conversation too